So healthcare, in, in the world of HR, is there any other topic where we all feel like experts and invalids at the same time? <laughs> right, right, I mean, is that, is that how you feel sometimes? Because when you think about it, think about your last renewal. For some of you, it may have been just a little bit ago. For those of you who may have had a January 1st uh, time and your, your renewal was a few months before that, for some of you, your renewal is coming up soon, right? And if you think about that, how'd you feel the last time? Right? How'd you feel? How'd you feel? Did any of you jump for joy like that? <laughs> Did any of you jump for joy because it was just in the single digits? Yeah, we, we, hey, we got by with this. Who had negative trend on their last renewal? Who got a negative? Why, you, why, why are you not celebrating? <laughs> you don't want to jinx it, do you? You don't want to jinx it. All right, how many of you had negative trend for the second time in a row? Anybody? How, how many of you feel more like this when renewals come? Anybody like this? Yeah, I get you. I get you. Is, is this how it is? Like, you know, from February, right? In February from Sherm, I mean, this is what the average looks like by the nation. And we know it varies. Could be higher. If it's lower than this, it's probably because we've had to gut it. It's probably because we've had to gut our plants. You know, when I was VP of HR uh, three years ago down in the Bay Area, our family plans were over $30,000 $30, a year, right? Is that sustainable? Now, you know as well as I do, for most of us, this is the second largest Pay, this is the second largest expense on our on our on our on our on our books, right? Second only to what? Payroll, right? I mean, this is a fortune. This is a fortune. This is from this is from February of this year, folks, right? And and again, if yours is higher, I get it. If it's lower, then the chances are good. It's because we've we've adjusted. We've played around with deductibles or out of pocket maxes, right? Why? So we can afford it. We can afford it. The Affordable Care Act. Yeah, right. right crazy, crazy. But what we know is this, right? If we keep doing what we're doing, what's gonna happen? Keep getting what we're getting. Well, think about this. For those of you who've been around the block for a while, I know, us, right? Those of us who've been doing it, does that look familiar? This is what the trend's been looking like for the last 30 years. This is the last 30 years. Does it look like it's working? These are the healthcare costs for the last 30 years, folks. Does that look like anything's changing for total healthcare costs? Does that look like it's working? And how many rounds have we heard health care reform? At least three over the last 30 years that we've had major health care reforms? Does that look like it's getting fixed? Whatever's happening, it ain't working, is it? It's not working. Now, I asked a question. Now, I asked this question about, oh, what's it been? It's been a few years. It's been a few years, probably about 12, 13 years ago. I asked a question, and I asked this question, what if it could work? What if it could work? And so the stuff that I'm talking about here is based on that, the answer to that question of what if it could work? What if healthcare reform was local and not global? What if I stopped waiting around for somebody to fix it for me? What if I stopped waiting for my broker to bring me a solution? What if I stopped waiting for the government to fix it? And what if I started to figure this stuff out? Right? What if we started to take all the stuff that we heard at the conferences and we actually started to implement a thing or two? What if? So here's what I found. So I've been with Wagstaff a little over three years, and so here's what I found. And so uh, I mean, this is this is what I found. Maybe, maybe you know, hear me if you, you know, stop me if you've heard this story before. So when I got there in 2016, we we're facing this renewal. So for the previous four renewals, right, for the previous four years, they'd almost doubled their spend on their insurance. Right now, they have 400 people that are insured. Right, they have 400. And for some, you can say, "Well, that's a big plan." For some of you, they're like, oh, that ain't that big. It's an average size. It's an average size. About 400 employees. They almost doubled their spend in four in four renewals. Double-digit increases. And what you don't see the rest of the story is that these double-digit increases have been going for years before this. And so you know what I did? I projected it out using real numbers. I just forecasted, simple forecasting, guys, run it in Excel. And I said, what does it look like 10 years from now? If nothing else changes, have you ever done this? If you haven't, you should. And when you wake up, <laughs> this is what you're gonna find. And I guarantee you that my revenues do not go up the same way that those cost you. I guarantee you the revenues don't change, right? Guarantee you. How do you afford that? How do you afford that? I don't, because if I do nothing, if I do nothing, that's what's gonna happen. So what do I do? Well, previous to this, what were they doing? Same strategy that uh, most of us are doing. What, cost share and gut, cost share and gut, cost share and gut. And is that really a strategy? It's not really a strategy, is it? 
And so what happens? If I ask this question, what if you could? Because it's a question that I've asked before and it's a question that two other times we've done the same thing that I'm going to show you here. We ask this question, what if you could bend the curve? I'm not so as naive as to say, well, we could reverse trend, right? We could reverse this, we could change this, we could make this go backwards, but I ask the question, could we bend the curve? So let me show you, in three years, what happened? In three years, I've had three years of negative trend. Is it, and what do I do? Did I get it? No, I actually increased benefits. I've improved, I've improved the benefits and my employees today are paying a heck of a lot less themselves for health insurance than they were three years ago. Is it possible? You betcha. You want to find out how? Yeah. 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 <laughs> You're smoking something, huh? Yeah, I know it's legal in this state and yours. I know. And that's not part of my health care plan. <laughs> It's not. All right, so that's what we're talking about. So is it possible? It is. But it's got to change. We, we got we to change our thought process because it's going to require a new mindset. And it requires a new mindset. And we're going to come up with all kinds of excuses. And I'm not telling you that you have to change everything today. But it does require a new mindset because in order to get the new results, we have to do things different. We have to ask different questions. We have to ask better questions. And is it possible? You betcha. And I'm going to say, can you fix this overnight? No. You see, I had this one employee employer who went to my brokers and I've known they have had, I've known my brokers so I work with Mercer and uh, and and Mer they went to Mercer and they said well what's a great example they said well go visit with Wade he'll share some things with you all right so he comes over and visits with Wade and he says show me oh Yoda right what's going on and I share with him some ideas not the whole thing I just show him some ideas and some results this is a, a while back and so I said but look you've got to study you've got to understand you got to take the time to learn these things and you got to tr go try some things out but I told him look you've got to take you got to learn you got to apply these things and I'm going to show I'll sh I showed him some of the things I show I'm going to show you today but it's going to take work what was his response? His response was to go back and, and, he, sh and he shared with the brokers, look, I've been, you know, we've been a Mercer client for years. I should have the same program that Wade has and he fired his brokers. I'm like, you just don't get it. You don't get it. And he, guess what? He still doesn't get it. So understand, some of these things are, you know, are going to be different. Because here's where the typical strategy is. If you're a January 1 start, right? If we start the plan here, this is what our typical process is, right? We you know, open enrollments around, what, November-ish, right? We start figuring out, oh my gosh, what are we going to do, right? How are we going to restructure this? Holy Hannah, right? Because our new renewals are here in August, September. Well, here comes our typical strategy about here. Okay? <laughs> understand that hope is not a strategy. Oh, who am I kidding? We're in HR. Of course it is. <laughs> Sometimes it's our only strategy. Sometimes it works, right? <laughs> it works. Sometimes it's our only strategy. But uh, when we use this as our strategy, sometimes after we crack open the, uh, the renewal, right, they walk by our office and, you know, what happens is that when we open up the envelope, when we open up the envelope, if we haven't had a strategy, the only strategy that we have once we crack open that envelope is mitigation. It's mitigation. Because there is no other strategy at that point. We can't change the results, can we? We can't change the results. At that point, we're just trying to figure out how can we afford it at this point. And at this point, you've cracked open the envelope and you've seen the results and what? You start to pass out and at that point, all they say is, yeah, sorry, she's dead. <laughs> yeah, there's nothing else that we can do about it. When we're talking about these kinds of strategies, right, we have to start here. We have to start in advance. These are proactive strategies that we have to work with. Does that make sense? We can't start, when we open up the renewals, that is too late to figure out what we're going to do for that plan year. We have to plan now to figure out how to adjust it in the future. And why is that? Because what's the number one driver of your costs? Use is the claims, right? The number one driver of your costs is claims. And so if we're going to affect your costs, what do we have to affect? <coughs> claims. In order to affect those claims, we have to affect the people who are driving the claims. Huh? So in order to affect those, we have to affect how they're using it, affect their claims, because what? Healthy employees don't go to the doctor. Weird, huh? Weird. So if we can get them healthier, get them educated, help them to figure out that urgent care costs less than the ER, Help them figure out that things like telemedicine is a lot cheaper than going to the doctor at all. That they don't have to go to the ER for eczema. Little things like that start to add up. Weird. 
So the first thing they say is, all right, wait, so what does it look like? Where are you at? Okay, let me share with you. You saw my results, right? You saw my impact. Well, what's what are we looking at? Look, after you know, two years, you know, when we first started, we were fully funded. We were fully funded in a desperate situation. The following year, we got to a point where we went self-funded. We went self-funded. And when we went self-funded, we, you know, we have cash on hand, but we didn't set anything aside. We just kind of went with a zero reserve. We were at zero reserve. Today, I have $2.2 .2 million at the bank for reserves. And we actively spend that money. I actively spend it. We built a gym. I have a trainer on site that does group sessions in the afternoon. I spend money out of that cash account like crazy, and I've got 2.2 .2 million bucks in that account. Not bad, right? Not bad. So how do you get there? So they're asking me, what's the laundry list? Give me the list of what I have to go do. But we have to ask better questions. Here are two questions that you got to ask before you get to the how. Number one, what do you want? What do you want? Because if you don't know what you want, you don't know where you're going to get to. And if I give you a laundry list, you'll go do it, but you don't know why. Which is the second question, why do you want it? So let's focus on these questions first. Now understand, as we go through this, right, we start popping it, which is why I gave you all the slides and why I'm recording this, because we'll give you the, the recording of this too. So when you're like, what did he say? <laughs> I don't know. Just don't quiz me. I have no idea what we're going to say. Okay, number one, what do you want? Look, Dad always said nothing's dynamic unless it's specific. If you want dynamic results, you've got to be specific about what you want. If you want better results, all right, here's a buck. You just got more money, right? That's it. You've got to be specific about what you want. Number two, why do you want it? Because here's the deal. If all you want is more money, that's not going to be a compelling enough reason to get you the results that you want. Once the employees find out that all you want is to make more money for the company, they're not going to help you out. If all they find out is that you want more money because this company wants to save more money, too bad. That's not a compelling enough reason for them to get on board. They won't care. They won't, and they won't help you out. If the number one driver is claims, and the claims come from not just the employees, but their spouses and the dependents, they don't care. They don't care. You gotta find a better why. You have to find a better why. And then when we get into the how, you also have to figure this one out too. Because if you are the only one who's in charge, if you're the HR person and you're the only one who cares and are doing this, you don't have enough, enough uh, horsepower to do this. If, you're, if, you're super, if, you're, uh, if your bosses are not on board and if your employees are not on board to help you out, you don't have enough horsepower and you never will. So we've got to get a bigger team on board to make this thing work. Does this make sense so far? All right, good night. Now at this point you're telling me, some excuses. Are you not? Is this going through your head? That's nice, Wade, but you came all this way, but I can't. I can't. But we're fully insured, so this isn't going to work. Or we're too small, so it's not really going to work. Or we're community rated, so it's not going to work. Are these some of, the, some of the excuses going through your head about now? I hope not, because like all these things will work. This is the third time through, and I've done this for fully insured, I've done this for self-insured, I've done this for different sizes of plans, and I've never had an ROI not hit by the 12th month. And I've never hit a savings of less than a million bucks by the second year by implementing some of these things. So as we go through what I'm going to share with you now, understand that some of these things may not work for you. They may not. But what if one of these things does? Some of these things may be just cornball ideas. But what if one of them isn't? But some of these things you may say, I'm already doing that. Cool, if you are, keep doing it. But what if one of these things is a new idea and what if it would work, right? What if it would work? So is this making sense? Mm -hmm. All right, do we need to explore anything else before I jump in and give you some thoughts? It's like, get going, let's go. Okay. Let's get to the what, all right. All right, so here's, here are your three things, right? This is what it takes, right? These are the three things in terms of the package of what you gotta take into consideration as we're going down this path. Now, the way that I package this up is, you know, we only have about 50 minutes to do this, so we could talk all day long about any of these packages, about any of these things. And what we do, right, what we've done is taken some time, and there are lessons learned over the course of 12 years or longer as we go through these things. So understand that any one of these topics, if you want, uh, we can go through this. Now, the slides are available, as you know, through the email on my, on my site at wadelarson.com. And also, with questions that you have on any one of these things, please feel free, pull out your business card, write your questions on the back of your business card, and then you can drop them off with me afterwards. I'll be hanging out for a bit afterwards, but I know you have to get back to work and all that good stuff. So if you don't have time to hang out afterwards, please feel free to drop, you know, jot your question on the back of the business card, leave it with me, and I'm happy to interact 
contact afterwards. Cool, we can talk. I'm, that's great. That's fantastic. But let's talk about these three areas and I'll see, you know, and, and see where we go. Sound good? So as I share these things, I've got a ton of stuff. We're going to hit these things and chances are good. I'm not going to fully bake any single one of these topics. There's probably a good chance I won't fully bake any one of these things. So if we hit one of these topics, you're like, I don't get that. Chances are good I did not spend enough time on any one of these topics. There's a good chance of that. So that's my caveat. There. That said, let's get going. Here are three things that we've got to make sure that you have to make this thing, this thing work. Number one are partnerships. You can't do this thing alone. And if you try, it's going to be an utter failure. So we'll talk about who those partnerships are with. Number two, we're going to talk some, about some of the best practices. Are there other best practices that I'm not going to share? You betcha. But I'm going to talk about some key best practices that you're going to need to implement uh, or that you should consider. Number three, some new mindsets. To some of you, you're going to say, this is cray cray. And you are correct. This could get you sued. Probably will. But, you, but that's okay. You ought to take a look at it. Because they don't. They actually don't get you sued. They save you money and they're genius. But you ought to take a look at some of these things. So let's take a look and, and see what these things are. First, let's talk about partnerships. Your first and most important partnership has got to be with your employees. When your employees start to become consumers of healthcare, this is where the change happens. This is it. Here's the most important principle that they need to understand and that you have to teach. Once they understand that health insurance is just like car insurance, things start to change. They don't understand that insurance is insurance. The reason why we don't speed is because we don't want tickets. Because when you get a ticket, what happens to your rates? Go up. Goes up. The reason why you don't wreck your car is because when you wreck your car, what happens to your rates? They go up. When you get sick and you wreck your body and you go to the hospital, what happens to your rates? Nothing. I don't know. Once they understand that insurance is insurance and it all acts the same, they start to say, what? Most people don't understand that insurance is insurance. They don't. If you haven't had this conversation, this is eye-opening. This is the first principle that I will teach employees to get them on track. Because then the next principle is this. When claims go that when claims don't go up, neither do their costs. And once I help them understand where the key drivers of costs are, they start to get educated. Once I show them what the ER rates are, and I start to show them how many people go to the ER, they say, who went to the ER? <laughs> Doesn't matter. It's probably you. And they, and they say, well, uh, but I had to. Really? It was 2 p.m. on Saturday. There was an urgent care next door. Right? And we start to educate about alternatives. I had my hand chopped off. Okay, yes, go to the ER. My kid have a fever. You call the nurse hotline. Right? You call the nurse hotline. Okay, has 105 fever? Yes, go to the ER. 98 degree fever? You call the nurse hotline. You start to educate. I felt bad I was going to throw up. You call Teladoc. I gave it to you for free. I'm paying for Teladoc for free. You call Teladoc. You start to educate. But then what happens is principle number three of helping the number to say that when the company saves money, they save money. And that's where it starts to make sense. If we don't have to raise our rates, we won't pass the rates on to you. And those are where they start to understand talk more about education in a bit. Does that make sense? If they can understand how costs go up, they start to understand. And you have to do that first. Okay. Number two, your brokers. If your brokers only show up once a year, they're not really your brokers. They're pimping your insurance plan. Yes, I said that. And we're in HR. If, you're, if that's the only time your brokers are showing up, they're not your brokers. They're not your partners. They're really not. My brokers work for me all year long because, look, I, I drop 100 to 120 grand a year on my brokers. It's a six million dollar plan, you betcha, and they're working for me 24/7. They do, 
they earn their pay. They really do because this is a big deal. I talk healthcare year round because my strategy is going year round. It has to. Wellness programs, strategies, this stuff is cooking year round. It has to. I have to talk this strategy all the time with, with how many moving parts I've got. And they've got it. In fact, my brokers, I've got two brokers. Yeah, I've got two. I say I'm married to one and the other's my mistress. <laughs> and uh, I love it because they don't like it. They don't. I love Mercer because they're very conservative and they're my think tank and I drop a pretty penny to them. My mistress is a small little boutique broker that's in Coeur d'Alene. And why I like them is because they're on the cutting edge and they are part of this network and they come up with some crazy stuff. Really crazy stuff. On occasion they throw me some stuff, I'm like, I might get sued for that. I like it, keep talking. Right? It's some really edgy stuff. I'm like, I'm not sure I'm quite ready for that, but keep it going because they keep me on the edge to say, maybe I'm exploring some different things. And so I actually get some services from them that I can't get through Mercer because it's too controversial. And so I actually have this tug of war going. It's a yin and yang. It's a, it's a yin and yang relationship between the two of them. It's kind of cool. It's kind of cool. But see, you know, I've got the health insurance plan and that's fine, but I also have this wellness and employee engagement that, that's going on. Data analytics, I can't get the data analytics through Mercer. I've got my data analytics through this other broker. I've got cost containment strategies from both sides and I've got new strategies coming left and right. But that's how I play my brokers. And you know what? Between the two of them, I keep them honest. It's awesome. It's awesome. Use your brokers, but, but use them back and forth. I mean, really do. And then there's the carriers. Here's the question, do your carriers remember who's paying the bill? Or do they think that they're the ones driving the boat? And if you say, well, I'm only here, I only have one option. Do you really? You've got options. You can drive the boat, right? You're the one who's driving this, right? And the question becomes, do you really have the best deal? Well, we can't change it because we've had this relationship for decades. You know, I get that, I get that. We had Primera for decades. And you know, because of how much change we had, I had to manage this, but it was a matter of time. I fired Primera this year. I fired them, I went to a different way because I had to carve out my, my RX, and I had to car out, carve out my stop loss. I had to, to make my plan work, I had to carve those things out, and Primera wouldn't let me. It was my plan and they wouldn't let me. You know what, this year I carved it out, it was just a matter of time and I had to. Just by carving out my RX alone, I, had the, I got access to my Save Express Scripts network and I saved $250,000. Because Primera is, well, oh, but we have the best, the best contractor grades. Bull. Bull. And I knew it. And I've known it and I've paid a premium for it. No, I didn't. I didn't. You know, your providers, yeah, your doctors and hospitals, are you getting the best rates? Are you? But we're in Bend. Yes, you are in Bend, but are you really? Because the chances are good, you probably have a handful of doctors based on feedback and based on data that you can have access to. There are probably a handful of doctors that are messing with your patients. There are some, there's some, some doctors that are probably really good doctors where your, doc, your, your patients are going there and they go there once and they get healed and they're done. There are other doctors where your patients are going back four, five, six times and they are still not getting well. Or they have to go back four, five, six times because that's just the process so that they can milk the billing milk the billing and they're not getting better any more than just the person who goes back once and done. They're milking the billing and that happens all the time. All the time. And do you know whether that happens or not? They can be part of the same network. They can be part of the same network but that fraud happens all the time and they're milking the system. Why? Because they've reduced the rates, the negotiated rates so, so hard that the doctors have figured out if I bring them back through the system for four times, five times, six times, whereas before I could do it just the one time, I can make this work to get my golf fees back. That happens all the time. Do you know if they're playing you or not? Right? You can do that. So those are some of the things in terms of partnerships. Right? You start working these numbers, you're going to start saving money very quickly. As you start to save money and you start to show this to your leaders, to your managers, they're going to start to understand because you're going to start to save money very quickly. Does this make sense? And this is all doable. And you say, well, wait, you've got to have a staff of six people on your team to just manage this. No, I've got a staff of three. I've got a staff of three, and yeah, HR is what we do. This is our part-time gig, right? This is our part-time gig. Because we use our partnerships to do this kind of stuff. By engaging the employees, they're working for me. 
I'll tell you some other things that we do to help them work for me. Because they're working for me, they're coming up with new ideas to make this stuff happen. So, questions so far? Is this working? All right. You ready for some more? All right. Exciting stuff. Cool stuff. Now let's get to the real cool stuff. All right. Let's talk about best practices. Number one, you've got to have a strategy. You cannot wing this stuff. If you're flying by the seat of your pants, it could work. You could do this, but you've got to have a strategy. If you don't have a plan, it's not going to work. You've got to, you've got to have at least a general understanding of what you want. But number one thing is this has to be participative. You've got to get your employees involved because if they don't buy in, this will never work. Now, please understand, you're never going to get 100% buy-in. You're not. There are going to be 25% of your employees that are going to be, yeah, let's go, let's go, go, go. Use them, abuse them, and let them drive this train. They're going to be the momentum takers and get them going. There's going to be another 25% that are going to be naysayers. You could give them free cash. Understand, I give a lot of free cash away. And people complain because it's not in the right denominations. <laughs> I'm giving them cash, a lot of cash, and they still whine about it. Okay, that will always happen. That will always happen. You can't, you know, it's a Ricky Nelson moment, right? You can't please everyone, so got to please yourself, right? Just do it. Just do it. Because what I find is that if, if the more I give away to employees, they get stingy. They get stingy. And once they have money in their hand, right, they start making better choices. And this is the whole key to the whole thing. The 50% in the middle are going to just go with whatever they need to go with. That's what you have to just manage. But make it participative. It also has to be multidimensional. This whole one shot, this, you do A, B, and C. You know, you, if you just do A and then you get it, it's not going to work. You have to have this be multidimensional. You have to take this on a wellness front. On a, on, on, you have to have multidimensions to this. We could talk more about this later. But you do have to have buy-in from the top. This has to have a stamp of approval. But here's the quickest way to make this work from the top. Once you start making dollars and cents of this and show them how much this saves, you're going to get it. And sometimes you're going to need to have a leap of faith. Sometimes it's, trust me, but if they don't trust you, whatever, have them talk to me for 10 minutes. We'll talk real numbers, seriously. But this has to be multi-year. You can't promise this to be done. You, you can't shift the, titan the Titanic around in five minutes, right? We tried that, still hit the iceberg. Uh, but it's not going to work. This, gotta, this has to be a multi-year process. It really does. But you have to have the strategy. But the th cool thing is, is that when you treat employees like partners, they start to act like partners. Now with that, that also means that we can't just say, you know what, we do treat them like partners. When we get, when we get the bad days, they have a bad day too. They're tired of that. Because when we start to have good days, they also have to have good days too. If we start to save money, they have to start, start to save money as well. And that's where this whole thing starts to, to, to work out. So let's talk about this on the wellness front. How many of you have a wellness, wellness component? Got a little bit? I see half. I have some little kind of do. Kind of, kind of. You've got to be all in on this wellness because the number one driver of cost is claims, right? Claims are leading to health. And the way to tackle that is through a wellness program. Now, here's the other cool thing about wellness is that this is the sneakiest way to increase employee engagement. They don't know that you're addressing employee engagement by doing wellness stuff. They just think that you're doing some fun stuff. It's a sneaky way to do employee engagement. It really is. But it's got to be well, it's got to be rewards and incentives. Now here's the deal on this. You can't get million dollar outcomes with five dollar gift cards. Let me repeat that. You cannot achieve million dollar outcomes with five dollar gift cards. You can't. So if your idea of doing a, of, of having these incentives is by dropping 15 bucks into their HSA and that's your wellness incentive, it's not enough to be compelling enough for them to do anything on this stuff. It's not. There should be an HSA connection to it, right, so they can save some money, some money. But the other part of this, this is the yin to the yang. You need some penalties in there for those who don't want to play. If they don't want to play, that's okay. They don't have to, but they should be paying a price for not playing. Let me give you an example. Here's how we work. We have some key components to our plan. Now we have a PPO and we have an HSA. You should always have a choice when it comes to wellness because even if the second choice is a bad choice, people always want a choice, correct? Even if it's a bad choice, people want a choice. It's okay, it's okay. That bad choice is what helps to fund all the good choices. It's great, it's fantastic. So the first thing we start with is tobacco incentive. Now, tobacco incentive is this. 
Remember, the incentive has to be big enough to be compelling. Is 600 bucks a year compelling? Would you take a test to tell me that you don't use tobacco for 600 bucks? I thought it was okay. I thought it was okay. It's a cotinine swap. You come in, so it's part of, we have on-site biometrics. So to get this discount, all you have to do is take a cotinine swap. That all right? If your spouse is on the plan, he or she has to do it too. 600 bucks. I don't want to take no cotinine swab. All right, then don't. 600 bucks. That more than, that more than pays for my on-site biometrics. That's it, 600 bucks. You don't have to do it, but you're gonna pay 600 bucks extra a year. All right, do I have a reasonable alternative? Yes, I do. Yes, I do, we do, I, I meet all the criteria, it's fine. But that's the first step to the incentive. Then comes my wellness incentive. Now, wellness is important. So even if I, you're on the PPO plan, we have a wellness incentive. Now, if you're on the PPO plan, you're not ready to actually pay attention to your biometrics, but I want you to have your biometrics. So you know what, if you go get your biometrics, I'll give you a $300 to, uh, to incentive for your for your premiums. Would you go get your biometrics for 300 bucks? I'll pay for your biometrics, they're free. All you have to do is come in and do biometrics on site. Third party does it. Would you do it for 300 bucks? Maybe, maybe not, some do, most do. All right, here's the HSA side of the things. Now HSA, we set it up to make the lowest deductible possible, which is $1,350 a year. That's the lowest possible we could. And we made it that low. And the, so for the family deductible, the lowest we could do is two deductibles, right? So the family deductible is 2,700 bucks. It's the lowest we could do. So you know what we did? We made it possible for them to earn the entire deductible back through wellness incentives. It's the lowest possible deductible and they can earn it back. So the employee could earn $1,350 back in their HSA. Cool, right? Cool. And if they have a spouse, guess what? They can earn it back too. 2,700 bucks in their HSA. How's that? And then because we're saving so much money on this, the employee only rate for healthcare is 10 bucks a month. And because of the chunking down that we've done on the cost savings, we got this year, we just dropped the uh, family rate down at another $100 a month. Empl the family rate is $297 a month for family rates for a robust plan. Huh. As they help us out, we're giving it back. The PPO plan, all we did was we locked in the rate. Whatever the last rate was when we went to this plan, we just locked it in. So their reward for helping us out is no increases. But I'm not chunking, I'm not chunking away, but they're still paying over $600 a month for it. And you know what? I still have 40% of the people still doing it. Bad choice, but they still want a choice. Those who are participating and helping us out, I'm rewarding. Do you think they love this? Now, how can I get a reserve of two million bucks by giving the money away? How does the, how does the math work? What? With fewer claims. How does that work? How can this possibly work by me getting money and saving money by giving the money away? How could that possibly work? Because when people have the money in their hands, they get stingy and they become better consumers of health care. Huh, that's weird. Isn't that weird? It's weird. We're entering into, our, into the fourth, so this is the, the, the fourth renewal overall since I've been there. This is the third renewal on the plan. I've got 2.2 million in the bank, and I'm projected to be 8% over budgeted still. So I'll have 3 million in the bank, and I'm giving the money away. I can't give this away, and I still have 40% that want to do PPO. Huh. Ready for more? For more? Ready for more? Okay, I gotta pick up the pace. Okay, I gotta pick up the pace, because hey, I only got 20 minutes left, so here we go. You ready for this? Pharmacy, who's getting killed by pharmacy? Specialty drugs, I spent $1.1 million of my claims on pharmacy last year. 700,000 of them are on uh, specialty drugs. Ouch, I'll tell you about one of my new strategies in a minute. But you've gotta start thinking differently about pharmacy. You don't have to just take it, you have to start thinking differently about pharmacy. How about value design? There's not a one size fits all about your value. You have to take into account who are my people and what plan actually works for them. 
And can I create a can I create something that has the right value for my people? Can I build something in that works for them? And talk about telemedicine. Telemedicine has to be part of the value plan because people don't have to go to the doctor. You can go to the doctor virtually for up to 70% of the common problems that you have and you can save a fortune on this stuff. When we start talking about the education, this is key. You have to start talking about open, not just open enrollment, but you have to start talking about year-round strategies. And these don't have to be pretty. These could be an email from you of, did you know? Did you know that urgent care costs the same as a copay versus your uh, the, the trip to the ER? Did you know that you can go do this? Did you know that you can go do that? And it's constant education. It's inviting the spouses in to open enrollment sessions because chances are good if you have guys, they don't know squat and the information isn't going to make it to the spouses. And once the spouses starts to educate, that's great. It doesn't have to be free. We make our stuff homemade. We do our stuff homemade. But making them believers and evangelists is key. And once they start spreading the word, it works. But then mining the data. If all you're doing is depending on the data that your carrier is giving you, that data is junk. The data is junk. Real, get Dig deeper. You've got to find the data from your, from your brokers. And if you can find a third party to mine some data, you've got to look at that. But if all the data is that you have is from your carrier, then dig deep and ask better questions. What are my trends? Who's being sick? Who are the groups? And how can I design my plan around that data? You've got to do a better job of mining that data. What are my groups and how can you design that around it? Because you can't fix what you don't know. And once you start to attack those groups that are sick and you start to provide those types of services to meet those needs, you can start to attack those groups and you can start to provide services that make sense. And then you can start to reduce those claims and you can start to say, this is how to address your issues. And then you start to see the claims go down. And then you can start to see those services go down. In the first year alone, I was able to knock my ER visits down by 45%. 45%. You know what that does to your claims? <laughs> yeah, seriously, 45%. Okay, so those are some of the best practices. Let's talk about these newer mindsets. And again, some of these things may work for you, some of them don't, but these may be some solutions that, that could just, you know, one of these alone may just save you a few bucks. You start talking about medical tourism. Now, this is not a new concept. This has been around for decades, but maybe this is an option. You know, we've had international tourism around for decades. That's where you send people off to a different country for the same, for the same procedure. You're like, really? Are you serious? Yeah, why would you do that? Because you can get these solutions for 60 to 70% less than you can here in the States. Seriously? Yeah, we've got a, got a relationship with a hospital in Costa Rica, SEMA. Same procedures. These guys are JSEC international, uh, uh, internationally certified. They come up here. I mean, they're, they're Costa Rican doctors, but they're all trained here in the United States. Mexico does this all the time. And uh, the, the care is phenomenal. These locations, phenomenal. We pay a cash price. It's 60 to 70% less than you can find here in the States. Seriously. But even domestically, what we found is, uh, and as we go through this process, we found a hospital that's not part of one of the networks. They're outside of Providence. They're outside of MultiCare. They're an independent hospital that's set up, and because they're not part of these systems, they can actually offer us these same services for 60 to 70% less than what we can find through the other, other hospitals. I can get a knee replacement for $18,000 all in, where through Providence, it's gonna be closer to $55,000 for a knee replacement. Yeah, why? Because I could do that. When I get into MRIs, for example, MRIs, that's a joke. An MRI could be $500, it could be $5,000 for the exact same MRI depending on where you go. I can, I can, I'll talk about these again, but you know, just sending them somewhere else, this medical tourism, it may make sense to hop somebody on a plane, fly them to a destination, have the surgery done somewhere else, and you can save thousands of dollars if you are self-funded. You say, but I only have like 100 people. It may not make sense to self-fund. If anybody has 100 employees, you should actually look at self-funding. If you're, if, depending on what your claims look like, if you're, 100, if you're 100 employees, you should look at self-funding. You say, well, I'm only 50. Again, all these strategies, you may make sense. Maybe, maybe not. Here's one that I'm looking at is direct billing. Another situation. 
you should take a look and see, does it make sense to pick up the phone because if 60% of your employees, even if you're a small employer, if 60% of your employees go to the same doctor or the same facility, it may make sense here in Bend to pick up the phone and say, can we have a direct billing relationship? Because if you can get the, the, uh, the location money in 30 days or less instead of the, the typical 60 to 90 days without all the paperwork, they may cut you a break of 25 to 50% off your bill. That is real. That is real. Pharma tourism. What we found is that pharmacy, especially pharmacy, you know, of the 1.1 million, $700,000 of it was specialty drugs for 29 people. Enbro, Humira, that's 5,000 bucks a month, folks. That's 500,000, that's, 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 that's 5,000 bucks a month. That's a ton of cash, is it not? But what I find is that I can send them over the border, I can send, fly them to San Diego, have them picked up by a transport, drive them over the border, drive them over the border, five minutes over the border, get the same drug from the same manufacturer, right, class A facility, they can pick up a 90 day supply, drive it over the border, it's all legal, it's all legal, stay overnight in San Diego, drive back the next day, pick up the next 90 days, come back, fly home, and I get to save a ton of cash. How much? I beta tested this last year with two people. Two people, two scripts each. Did it twice, I saved $75,000 after all costs. Uh-huh. I've got three people on a party bus next week doing the same thing, right? <laughs> yep, Taco Tuesday in Tijuana, you betcha. <laughs> Yep, uh, this has become a strategy. And you say, well, that's weird, Wade. That's weird, the state of Utah has adopted this as their primary strategy for specialty drugs. That's how they do it. If I have 10 of my 29 people do this, I will save $250,000 this year. And right now I'm on track to do that. That's pharma. Reference-based pricing, that could take all day long, but you're in Bend, and this is a sweet spot to come up with reference-based pricing. That's basically name your price. It's name your price for, 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 uh, for medical solutions. It's where you can, if you're big enough, if you have enough, enough volume, you could set up with a local, a local provider and say, this is what we're offering for the cash price. It's a, it's a complicated deal, I'd let you work with that. We do not use reference-based pricing where we're at, but that is a new solution that's coming up. We can talk about that later. HSA we talked about, captives are a newer thing. We just joined a captive where we have uh, like-minded like uh, employers that all get together and we pool our money for stop loss. We pool our money for stop loss. If we do well, I get cash back at the end of the year. And these are not small sums. I could get 50,000, 60,000, even $100,000 back a year if I have a good year for my stop loss versus dump the money in, dump the money in, dump the money in. And this is the final, you know, one of the final things, uh, international scripts. Even if, you're on a, even if you're a small employer, again, mail order. The employee, uh, the employee has a, uh, their, their script sent to them directly, 90 day supply uh, from this place called Petra RX. Again, my smaller, my, my mistress uh, broker, right? They have a 90 day supply sent to their home. They don't pay a copay. If they're on the PPO plan, they don't pay a copay. They get a 90 day supply sent directly to them from the manufacturer, internationally sourced. It's legal, internationally sourced. What's in it for them? Convenience, 90 day supply, they get the copay waived. What's in it for me, the employer? I get the drugs at half price. I've had, I had about two dozen people, maybe 30 people participate in this and over the course of a year and a half. I've got $50,000 saved. Yeah, stuff like that. Telemedicine we've talked about, coupons for Pete's sake, right? You can go to GoodRx, look it up, and uh, for, for, for coupons alone, right? Coupons alone, they can get cash price, typically go out there, take the coupons from GoodRx, go to the drugstore, get a 90 day supply for cheaper than they can possibly get it, even through their own, their own prescriptions, right? At this point, you're saying, good night, wait. You know, this is all crazy stuff, this is crazy stuff. I don't think we're gonna make this work. Well, that's not, I'm not asking you, I'm not telling you that you have to do this. I'm not telling you that you have to do this. I, I'm really not. But uh, it's up to you, it's up to you. But uh, up until now, you don't have to do it. You don't have to decide what, what you're gonna do. But to quote the ancient Canadian philosopher, Getty Lee, right? <laughs> you know, if you choose not to decide, you've still made a choice. And you're no worse off today than you were when you walked in here today. 
but you know, uh, when I think of my old boss uh, and mentor, uh, Mike Hertz, you know, I worked for the fire district up there in Portland. You know, he he said, you know, as HR, you have a responsibility because you can do some things for your employees that they can't do for themselves. He says, but so knowing that, you know, always find a better way for your people because they're counting on you. And as we think through this, you know, our our, our process is transformation. And what I'm thinking about what we did at Wagstaff, you know, we start off with three goals. And the first goal and first and most important goal was we want to improve the health and well-being of our employees. And that was where we started. That's always where we start. And then the second goal was to help reduce their costs. And number three, and this, this is our priority order, then we'll save money for Wagstaff. The funny thing is, is if we can improve their health and improve their bottom line, we'll improve our bottom line. And that's what it works. And so to give you the idea, I mean, we hand this stuff over to the Wellness Committee, and just to give you a snippet, you know, through our wellness events, even just last year alone, just one little thing, doing the wellness, doing the, uh, the weight loss challenges, we helped people 800 pounds. We lost 800 pounds. That's, that's impactful. With some of the money that, that, we, uh, that, that we use, we're able to hire an on-site trainer. She alone is responsible for 200 pounds of that loss. But what's not counted in this weight loss? is uh, we're able to test some new things out. And so you know, I talked about uh, one of our relationships of uh, the international, uh, international uh, uh, hospital. And so I did a try before you buy, and I said, well, let's give this a shot. Just a year ago, this guy was around, just a year ago. But this guy was struggling for 30 years, right? For 30 years, this guy was struggling. But even just a year ago, this guy was, was, was what he looked like. And for 30 years, the doctor would just say, eat less and exercise more. But what we find out from a doctor was that that solution actually works against them because of what was going on in the body type. And after you know struggles, after losing a chunk of weight, right, it just didn't work out. But because of this solution and trying some new things out, we're able to actually go down and get the surgery that, that actually worked for, for him. And that's what happens in a year, right? That's, transfer, that's transformation. And with this transformation, you can change lives, right? You can change lives, you can change their lives, you can change your life. But isn't that what we're in HR to do? Isn't this what we're in HR to do? It's not about saving money. It's not about saving money. This is about shifting what we're doing. This is about changing lives and this is what you can do. So with that, anyway, thank you very much. I don't know if we have time for, for a question or two. All right, let's see if we got a question or two.